about that, but it was important to me to continue to serve others after I retired. So I retired in uh, 2019, moved back to my own state of Arizona, uh, absolutely love it here, and, uh, and decided I wanted to continue to serve others. So I, I volunteer for a number of different groups, I'm on some boards, I'll just highlight two of those. One is that, uh, that I'm on the Board of Directors for Arizona State Parks and Trails and have learned a lot about uh, how the park system works here, uh, how we use funding like from the Land and Water Conservation Fund to fund not just uh, parks uh, from the state but also local entities, even fund some projects through the Game and Fish. And so I've worked, learned a lot about how funding works in, uh, in the state. I do uh, know that I may, if selected to be on the commission, I may have to give up that position. And frankly, if I do, the Game and Fish Commission would be my choice since my uh, heart is really with, uh, with wildlife. The second position I want to talk about and that I'm currently doing is that I'm uh, the ranch liaison officer for our sheriff of Santa Cruz County, David Hathaway. He asked me to serve in that position. He knew that I have a small ranch and some horses, uh, and he knew about my military experience, and he wanted to get an additional set of eyes and ears out. So I went through about 200 hours of law enforcement training. I now uh, patrol the mountains of southeastern Arizona, Santa Cruz County, on mostly on horseback, but sometimes on foot. And uh, that has given me a deep appreciation for what our wildlife managers actually go through and some of the uh, issues that they face. The bottom line is that with all of this experience and education, I think I'm the right person for the job. I've had a uh, lifelong love of wildlife. You know, I was in Boy Scouts growing up, became an Eagle Scout, backpacked all over the state. I've been a bow hunter for more than 50 years. I even worked uh, for a couple of stints as a deckhand on a charter boat and fishing out of Homer, Alaska. So I've got a little bit, bit of experience in, uh, in guiding. And, uh, and I have maintained uh, this level of wildlife throughout my career in the Army. I've got a bachelor's degree in wildlife ecology from the University of Arizona, which is where I met my wife. She also has a degree in wildlife and in her case, she actually worked in the profession. She worked as a biologist at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, when we were stationed there. And then she, everywhere we would move, she would volunteer. So in one place, she was the bluebird lady. The next place, she was the bat lady. But regardless, uh, you know, I kept my hands in it a little bit vicariously uh, through my wife and her experience. And I maintained my uh, membership in a number of conservation organizations throughout. I uh, am a believer in the North American model of wildlife conservation. I believe in that fully. And, you know, frankly, I've lived in many places in the state, uh, Cochise County, Santa Cruz County, Pima County, Coconino County. Um, and, uh, and so I absolutely love this state and want to continue to serve. I believe that the greatest asset I could bring the Game and Fish Department and the Commission is my deep leadership experience, leadership in, in both crisis situations plus, uh, plus the mundane. And if selected, I have three broad goals. Uh, the first is to select, successfully serve both the people and the wildlife of Arizona. The second one is to generate revenue. I am concerned about uh, potential lack of funding in the future with drops in license sales and things like that. Uh, so I think generating revenue is very important for our, uh, for our department. And lastly, I want to help make the Game and Fish Department a place where people can thrive. Uh, and just one last thing, I'll close my comments uh, by saying, you know, I work directly for and, and have personally met and served our last three presidents, uh, President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden. And I was successful in every one of those cases because I was not loyal to the individual. I was loyal first to the Constitution. And if you select me for this position, I'll be absolutely loyal to the state of Arizona's Constitution and to the wildlife and people of this state. So thanks for the opportunity to make some comments, and I look forward to your questions. I'll start off. You see you having an effect of five
I, I heard the question. Uh, for the group, he asked about my ability to attend every meeting. Uh, yes, sir. In fact, I just terminated one position I was doing as a senior mentor for the Department of the Army. That took me, frankly, all over the world. Spent time in Korea, in the Pacific, in Europe. And uh, I just stopped doing that so that I could spend more, be, frankly, spend more time with, with wife and family and have the same vision of a retirement that my wife had uh, when I retired from the Army. So uh, that would put me uh, here in the state. I still do travel occasionally, but I would work that around the dates of the commission meeting. Are, are you aware that there's nine commission meetings a year? Yes, sir. And that's just, a, and a lot of them are out of, not in Phoenix, Six of them are out on the road, so there's a lot of traffic. Great, sir. I I, I didn't enjoy Phoenix traffic this morning. There's so <laughs> quite a few more cars than in Patagonia. But I, I'm willing to travel all over the state. I do a little bit of that for the Parks Board. They just started having meetings. Our last meeting was in Flagstaff, and I was thankful for that, actually, to get to spend time away from the headquarters. So I understand about the six regions and, and how we rotate meetings, and I'm, I'm fully prepared to attend all of those. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Our, the commission meetings are not as far as Afghanistan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With the experience that you have, you've probably seen one of the issues that we have here in Arizona. See, Arizona Constitution and laws grant management responsibility to the department, and the commission makes the, the general framework rules for that management. Uh, the interface between the federal government and Arizona's responsibilities is not always simple. I have a feeling you've dealt with this somewhere in the past. Yes, ma'am. One of those aspects is that we deal with multiple federal and state agencies, but the federal ones like BLM, Forest Service, Parks and Recreation, uh, we have many, many federal designations on our southern border of the state. Uh, those, each, every, each and every one of those carries a list of uh, goals, objectives, and processes that one needs to comply with for utilization of those areas. The increase in uh, wilderness designations restricts the department's ability to manage uh, for fire prevention, for forest health, for water systems management, and for general uh, preservation of the safety and the uh, enjoyment of those places. And I'd like to know what your feeling is on that subject. Sure. Well, first of all, let me uh, let me talk a little bit more broadly about state and federal responsibilities with respect to wildlife, and then I'd like to narrow in on what you just talked about with the wilderness areas. So, uh, if you go back to the founding of our country, a lot of people think that the Pilgrims came here to the United States for religious freedom. And what they don't understand is that. In fact, if you were living in England in the 1600s, all the wildlife was the property of the king. You couldn't hunt or fish, and if you killed one of the king's deer, that was a hanging offense. So one of the reasons that they came to the, what we now know as the United States is the freedom to hunt and fish and, pro, and provide for their own families. And that process, that mindset, is deeply embedded, obviously, in the North American model of wildlife conservation, but it's also written into the laws of our country, and I'd argue even our national identity. So wildlife is the property of the public. It's part of the public trust. It doesn't belong to an owner, a landowner. You can own all the beef cattle on a certain land, but you don't own the deer or the turkeys. The people of the state do. The exception are things that move across state lines. Uh, for example, waterfowl that migrate across state lines, those seasons are regulated by the federal government. 
And that actually makes sense when you think they don't just spend time in Arizona, but all the way up and down the Rockies, for example. So I think there's a place in wildlife management and responsibility for the federal government and a place for state government. Sometimes I think that the lines have been skewed. If you talk about the deer herd up in the vicinity of Fredonia, you know, that may move across the state line between Utah and Arizona, that doesn't mean it's a migratory species and should be managed by the federal government. You know, I think deer are a non-migratory species and should be managed by the state. So I, I think that we all have responsibilities, and if we work together as partners, uh, we can generally be more successful. I did, in my last job, I did command all of the military forces that were supporting Customs and Border Protection deployed from Brownsville to San Diego. And so I, I have a lot of experience with border security, uh, and I have a lot of opinions based on that experience. And sometimes uh, what one agency does uh, may be in the seeming interest of its own goals, and purpose and reason for existence, but it can become in direct conflict with another one. And if you'd like, I can go on to that. But I know your question was about wilderness areas, so let me focus on that. As I mentioned, one of my sons is a hotshot in the Forest Service. Uh, he's on the Mormon Lake Hotshots, based out of Flagstaff. And he spends basically from April to late September every year fighting wildfires. Uh, in Generally speaking, I think in the Southwest we have a, a and uh, one thing, I don't, I've never worked and served in the Forest Service, but as I understand now, there's different cultures in different regions. So the Southwest region, which is basically Arizona and New Mexico, does believe in managing the forests, controlled burns, etc. cetera. Uh, if you go to California, they have an entirely different mindset and a different problem. And the result is you get sometimes 50 or 60 years of fuels built up because they don't burn nearly as much. And so a small wildfire rapidly becomes out of control and becomes a, a huge danger. So I think we've got to bring common sense to uh, all of these. I was most recently in a wilderness area with my wife in the Gila Wilderness Area in western New Mexico. We were on a backcountry uh, horse trip Absolutely loved it. It was wonderful. I do have some experience in wilderness areas, but I also need, believe that you need to bring common sense to it. If lightning strike causes a wildfire, I don't think you should keep Forest Service out without being able to use their chainsaws. They're actually just trying to control the fire. Not necessarily eliminate the fire, but at least control it so that it's managed. Uh, because I am a believer in conservation wise use of our resources, not, not just, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that there aren't places for preservation, like on National Park Service land, I'm okay with that, but our forests and Bureau of Land Management land, federal land, I believe should be conserved and available for use by others. Hopefully that answers it. Now, if you want me to jump on border security and movement of Jaguars, I'm happy to go there. We might go there a bit, but thank you. That that was a very good answer, in my opinion, to your to the first part of the question. Second part is you are from Southern Arizona, or you live there now. We're sort of slightly west of you, Arawaka, which is okay. west of I-19 yes. instead of east yes. of I-19. And you're probably aware, and there probably are in your area signs put there that say illegal activities and uh, narcotics or persons are. Uh, may be encountered here, and it's a caution sign. And uh, every journalist who comes by our place, which is a lot of journalists, takes a picture of that sign. And we know that there are families that used to camp in 36B, our, our neck of the woods, and 36A and 36C, all that same general area, uh, who no longer feel safe to camp in that area. Uh, do you have an observation on that subject? So there are a lot of people uh, moving through that area. Um, so let me let me just say first, you know, I see one of those signs most days. I live on Harshaw Road outside of Patagonia, and there's a sign right there on Harshaw Road. Last week I was taking my daughter deer hunting uh, in 35B. Um, 
and uh, we bypassed one of those signs. We did not see any uh, undocumented aliens, uh, but we saw plenty of their sign when we were up walking in the hills. Lots of, you know, empty water bottles, blankets here and there, etc. cetera. Uh, having dealt with uh, our various agencies at the state, local, local and federal level, responsible for border security, as well as the Mexican Army, which I personally work very closely with the Mexican Army, not the various police departments in Mexico. Border security is a problem. I think that uh, we need security. Um, I also believe, you know, personally, if we want to go down this road, I believe we need immigration, but I believe it should be controlled. I believe that the people coming across, I don't, I don't have anything against the people, generally speaking, who, by the way, aren't Mexican. They're mostly from Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador. They're seeking a better way for their family. And, uh, and you know, frankly, I, I understand that. Uh, but I also believe it should be controlled. They ought to pay taxes so that when they, you know, use our emergency services in, the, in a hospital or send their kids to school, they're actually providing for their share of the, uh, of the burden. The one thing that I am against are the dudes in camouflage that are getting rich off these poor people, moving them back and forth. And of course, those are the guys that are also, you know, moving drugs. I, I, one thing that I saw that it happened, and this was actually in New Mexico and Texas area, not Arizona, but I'm sure the same thing happens here. You know, the cartels don't exist to make to move drugs. They, they exist to make money. And they'll do whatever they, they want to to make money, whether it's kidnap people, extortion, but certainly moving people and moving drugs are part of that. And in one, in one area, they, if they got a bunch of drugs that they wanted to move across the area, what they would do is they would control the movement of people, flood an area so that it attracted all the border patrol agents, brought them into a certain area, and then moved somewhere else. Uh, I am concerned about it, which is why I'm volunteering for my sheriff's department. Uh, I told the sheriff that I've been shot at way too many times in my life and I don't intend to get shot at again. And he understands that. He said he just wants me to be a good witness. So I, I, I ride on the trails and if I see things, I either call directly to the border patrol or back to the sheriff to make things happen. So I am concerned about it. I'm not as worried about the poor people who are just seeking a job as I am about the guys that are actually moving them. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your service and the service of your family. That's a very large commitment by your family. We appreciate that. Um, first, before I get into my main question, uh, do you have a current hunting and or fishing license? Yes, sir. I have a lifetime. It's a I'm very thankful that this state, I'm 100% disabled, and the state gave me a lifetime license for hunting and fishing combination. Thank you very much. Okay, can you name one or two ideas or innovations that you would like to bring to the Arizona Game and Fish Department should you be appointed commissioner? Yes, sir. So I'll, I'll just, I'll talk about a couple if you don't mind. One, I, I am concerned about, uh, about revenue. And I'm very mindful that the Game and Fish Department gets its funds, and this goes back to the North American model of wildlife conservation, but funding for Game and Fish and for conservation agencies comes from direct funding from hunters, anglers, boaters, and shooters. A lot of that, in addition to being based on license sales, is based on taxes on recreation equipment, which comes from the Pittman-Robertson Act and 1937. Uh, I'm concerned about how uh, this issue has raised its head within the last year, not in our state, but it could gain traction here, where somebody has proposed to repeal the Pittman-Robertson Act because they're just classifying it as taxes in general. And, and of course, it's taxes on specific equipment. So uh, that funds our agency. So I'm concerned about that, and I'm also concerned about the drop in, the potential drop in revenue based on lack of license sales. So here's one idea. 
uh, or two of them, and I think the agency does a pretty good job with outreach, with Wildlife Views magazine, with different camps it, it holds, but the key is we, we need to get young people to understand and be involved in outdoor recreation. It doesn't have to be hunting and fishing. Um, and so one of, one of my objectives would be, for example, reach out to the Audubon Society and get birders to buy a license because our agency funds wildlife conservation, wildlife recreation opportunities for them as birders, but right now they don't fit the bill. They don't pay for anything. They don't have a license to go birding. Well, I'm not saying that they should have a license to go birding, but if we can get them to voluntarily contribute, ultimately those funds come back to, uh, to help them. And right outside Patagonia, we have, for example, the Patent Center for Hummingbirds, it's run by the Audubon Society, so I think we as an agency should partner with private organizations like that to get help actually back to the agency who can, can help put resources in. Um, I'm also involved with the Hummingbird Monitoring Network. You know, we have volunteers at Trapper. Yes, we do in fact trap and band hummingbirds. And it's a neat organization, but it's international. It's not just the United States, it's not just Arizona. Although Arizona is where the national director lives, uh, there's ways to get universities on not just both sides of the border, all the way down into Ecuador, involved in this international effort. Ultimately, I'd like to see some of those resources come back to the Game and Fish Department, which in, is in fact charged with, uh, with resourcing uh, wildlife management in this state. So, Again, cutting back to the, the point of the question you asked me, one, I think we've got to have a lot more outreach, especially to youth, to get them engaged in outdoor recreation. It'd be great if it was hunting and fishing, but at least to spend time and energy in outdoor recreation to help fund our agency. And then second, open it up and think about working with private organizations for partnership. Thank you. My wife would love your hummingbird explanation. <laughs> Mr. Buchanan, certainly thank you for your service. It's, it's admirable and your family as well. Thank you very much. Um, well, polling has shown that an ever increasing number of Arizona residents are not aware of the role of, there, is a, of Arizona Game and Fish Department as it pertains to, pertains to all the wildlife in Arizona. Why is it important to raise that awareness level for Arizona citizens? Sir, thanks. Thanks for your question. I, I think it is because I, I think that people would tend to think of our organization as game wardens, and they probably think that, and obviously, I mean, wildlife managers are important part of what we do, uh, enforcing game laws, but if, if, you know, I don't know what the exact number is, but let's say 80% of the people in the state don't hunt or fish, or they may not even understand the roles and responsibilities of the Game and Fish Department when it comes to OHB, you know, licensing or boating or things like that, but their default setting is probably, well, I don't hunt fish, I don't need to be concerned about it. I think education is the key. You know, again, this tremendous wildlife resource we have in the state is, is their responsibility. They have a responsibility to help manage this because they're, they're, go back to what I said about wildlife being held in the public trust. This is, this is their ownership right, if you will. I, one thing that uh, amazes me is how many people don't really understand the power and the importance of public lands. You know, this is, this is one thing that sets our country apart from about every other country on earth. I read a good book a couple of years ago. It's called That Wild Country by Mark Kenyon. And it's all about the public lands. And, you know, and, and Mark is a bow hunter like me, but you know, he, he goes into one area to fish for trout and another area um, you know, to, uh, to backpack whatever, or hunt shed antlers. Um, but the one thing that this really helped me understand and helped me, I think, do a better job with the Parks Board is listen to others who, who may have interest in something that is not something that I'm interested in. So the example, was uh, he went to Moab, Utah, 
land managed by the Bureau of Land Management, and there's a big off-road community. Um, well, you know, I, I am not an off-road kind of guy. I do have an off-road off vehicle, it's called a tractor. Um, but I don't use it for recreation other than my own fulfillment to be out there managing horse pastures. Um, but based on that and based on really thinking about it, a lot of what the Parks Board does is help manage land for off-road vehicle use. And that has helped me gain a new appreciation for, uh, even though that is not my interest, it's still an important interest and people have every access or have every right to have the same access to those public lands that I do. So listening to these other groups is very important to me. And helping to, you know, and you can, you can look at the positions of the Sierra Club or the Cattlemen's Association with respect to Mexican wolves. You know, I mean, very different positions, um, but I think what we need to do is actually listen and be informed by others, and then we can bring better decisions. Good morning, Mr. Buchanan. I want to first um, thank you for being uh, to persevere and come in two years in a row. So it's good to see you. We have several commissioners in the past have applied multiple times and turned out to be great commissioners. So uh, I admire your perseverance. Um, you touched on this topic in your opening remarks, but my specific question for you is about what are the seven principles of the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation and that's the one you talked about, wildlife resources are conserved and held in trust for all citizens. How do you see that belief integrating with the ongoing role of the Arizona Game and Fish Commission and the department? Well, thank you, sir. I, again, I think that wildlife are held for all of us to enjoy, not a landowner. Um, not, uh, I, my last tour in the, in the military was in San Antonio, Texas. And don't get me wrong, I, I love the people of Texas. I love the food, I love the culture. I don't like the flat hot of Texas, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but one thing that I didn't appreciate about Texas is there's basic, basically no public land. And it's all held by private landowners. And if, if you want to hunt or fish in Texas, you better know a landowner and you either pay for a lease or get permission or, uh, or something along those lines. That's what we can end up with if, uh, if, if we don't have, if we don't maintain access for the public. Uh, I just shot a, uh, I shot a bull elk with my bow in New Mexico in September. And that was done on public land, you know, and, and it was, uh, I mean, it was it was not easy getting in. It was I shot him at about ten thousand feet, so it was quite a climb to get up there and everything. But it was on public land. Uh, to me, that's absolutely important. But it's important for the game and fish to manage wildlife throughout the state for everybody. And so, go back to my experience in Texas. I I, I know guys who have a fifteen thousand acre ranch, but they don't control when deer season is on that ranch. They don't. They don't manage the population. You know, the, the state, I think it's Texas Parks and Wildlife there, the state agency, they're the ones responsible for it because wildlife belong to all of us, not to, not to a landowner. And, you know, in the end, if I'm also very, as a bow hunter, of course, I'm a big believer in fair chase, in the principles of fair chase. Um, but I believe that, uh, you know, if, if you want to have a pen with a bunch of deer in it and go shoot a deer out of a pen, you know, you can pay to do that in Texas. But we shouldn't do that here in Arizona. Great. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I just right along, sort of related to what you were just saying, um, and especially I heard that you have served as a ranch liaison. Yes. Are keeping lands open for public recreation involves work at making the landowners feel like their wells and water lines and the rest of it will be respected by persons who use the land. We have signs that we've got from Game and Fish that say this is open to the public for legal recreation. Uh, 
please don't leave trash, please be respectful of the infrastructure here, so on. That has worked, the, the efforts of the department in the last, oh, it's been 10 years or more, maybe by now, maybe 15, uh, that the department has really worked to build good relations with landowners and with holders of uh, grazing permits uh, who previously felt that it was, you know, trash was everywhere and, and the there was, open. Uh, you know, windmills got shot up and right. water tanks got destroyed and water lines got cut and everything else. Now that is down a lot. Uh, what is your view of the role of the commission in building that trust and uh, collaboration between landowners and recreationists? So, I, ma'am, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think education is the key. So, I live in an area that is surrounded by Coronado National Forest, and most of the riding on horseback that I do with my wife is on Forest Service lands. And um, I can't tell you how disappointing and frankly disgusting it is to go into an area that's used as a camping area, and you find trash all over the place, uh, but you also find you know where people uh, go to the latrine and don't bury it. They just they leave toilet paper everywhere. It amazes me that people behave that way. My, for the most part, I think it's it's naivety. I don't think they're willfully doing things wrong, but there's a lack of education, a lack of experience on on things like that. And I believe that the Game and Fish Department again can play a role. Which you you know you don't see a bunch of land all over this state that is. Yes, we have state trust lands, but and we have Forest Service lands and BLM. We have all these lands. You know, the Game and Fish Department doesn't have 50% of the land, but they're responsible for managing wildlife everywhere. So I think the Game and Fish Department ought to play a key role in in educating others. Ought to liaise with with ranchers. You know, if if you get permission, if you're a landowner and you get permission for somebody to hunt, it's great when that, you get kind of a partnership with that person when they stop by and they want to check in. They say, hey, I'm going to be hunting tomorrow. Uh, you know, is everything still okay? If I do, do you want me to keep an, a lookout for any strays? I mean, just things in general like that. And when they come back out, they, they say, well, I didn't see any today or actually I did shoot one. You know, can I offer you some meat? Those kinds of things. That's a real partnership. Um, but people who abuse that, as you know, would never get invited back. I think for the most part, people don't abuse things because they're bad people. I think they just don't understand the impact of what they do sometimes. And if we can help educate them, they'll, they'll be better off. Thank you. Thank you, no. Mr. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you tell us about a recent commission directive or rule that you support or disagree with, and why? Sure. Uh, so I'll take uh, game cameras. Um, as as you know, uh, the commission, and I don't remember exactly what month or year, but 